Once again, here we are for our second series <coughs> that Everyone Has a Voice. Thank you for returning artists, poets, supporters. I want to take a moment first to do an intro and say thank you for those who are here. I always want to extend my gratitude and appreciation to Paul Engel on behalf of the Brockton Public Library representation for setting this up and allowing us to do this series, for also having the library accessible to all of us here in the city of Brockton and local surrounding towns. Thank you as well for Mark Lindy for the Brockton Cable Access Local TV Television Network. He constantly supports various, various entities in our communities because some people may not be able to attend, especially now that we're shifting in seasons. I thank you for the thesaurus. Yes, he likes to be shy, but I will call on him at the end. Save it for later. <laughs> or being the president and founder of organizing Everyone Has a Voice and allowing me to take part as a host. I also want to take a moment for a special visitor and a great supporter, and I will also call you at the end, Senator Jeremy Cassidy. I see you over there. <laughs> because you're a great supporter to everything that inspires me and motivates me in the city of Brockton. And that's very important to know that we have people in position who support us as well. What we're going to do is move forward with our open mic. We have lo lovely returning authors, poets, aspiring poets, youth, adults, different ages, different races and culture. We represent diversity. But of course, I love haikus because that's my shortcut in poetry. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to begin with myself to bring it back from last year. And I can assure you that I have a month between now and next month to actually come with a full poem. <laughs> so here's my first haiku before I do the first formal introduction. Every spoken word unveils the mask of our city. Winter, spring, summer, and fall. We are in fall in transition, so it will be winter. And now, let's embrace this beautiful moment, and I want to call on to the first open mic, Sheila Twining. Yes, it's you, Sheila. Thank you again. <laughs> Halloween's coming up. I have um, a kick coming up for Halloween. It's called On Becoming a Skeleton. Her arms are outstretched on dark, thick moss, never leaves withered and motionless hands. Her freckled face is pale, waxy, eyes and mouth open to greet the blowfly eggs. So maggots nibble into stiffening muscles, beetles gorge onto discolored skin, spiders, millipedes, and mites arrive to feast on bugs that are already there. Gradually, the muscles begin to relax as bacteria multiply and devour all the tissues. Her skin, hair, nails become loose and fall off, and in no time at all, there is nothing but bones. I live near the beach and um, down in the harbor, just behind the main street, is a very, very large parking lot. And there are always a bunch of cars there, but usually by late afternoon, half of them are gone. And one year, several years ago, there was a car there with an old woman living in it um, with piles of muddles and and water bottles piled in the back of her seats, and um, she had two cats in there with her, and you knew she slept in the car all day and all night. And the police would try to have her come out, and she refused, and, and so they kept an eye on her and, and just left her here, and finally she just one day disappeared. This is called The Other. <clears throat> Behind small harbor shops that wait for tourist crowds, in the parking lot where in the cold of winter portable docks and lobster pots are stored, where in summer sunburned bathers gather for band concerts and carnival rides. A woman lives in her car. She moved there when the geese were leaving, her faded Chevy rusted, taped, black plastic bags, frayed blankets, water jugs piled high in back, obstructing her vision. vision. She sleeps up front, reeds and putters, leaving more space for her cat than herself, hums along with their purring. She looks but doesn't see 
people stare at her and wonder if she's hot or cold, smelly. If hunger makes her stomach churn, why she spurns their helping hands. She nestles in her world, within the world, sits amidst the seagulls, sentinels of the harbor, they all watch the tides turn. just hearing your voice, your monotone, and just reading, because there's comfort in words, there's comfort in forms of expression. And uh, one of the subjects that you touched is actually things that we struggle with in the community in the city of Brockton, homelessness. You know, there are people that, that they find themselves too fortunate to sleep in a car, because many don't have a car. And many this winter, I feel like we're gonna have a cold winter, but they both spend times out there in or outside of a car without a home. So I thank you for putting your words and expressing things and expressing events and circumstances that happen in our everyday society. That's what poetry is about. Poetry is a beautiful entity to express yourself. And at this time, I'm going to call our next poet. And Jason, it's a pleasure to call on you again. Oh, great. Welcome. So I have uh, two books here, and um, I'm going to read one from my old book, one from my new book, and I figured I'd read one that, that I would start off with, um, that I wrote a little recently. So um, I guess I'll read the, the, the first poem from my, old, from my old book, and as long as, and it's called Memories of Crescent Street. And I grew up on Crescent Street in, in Grafton when I was a kid. Um, and I went back there as I, when I was a little older, and I wrote this poem about it. So it's called Memories of Crescent Street. I remember when I was young, not really, most of the memories are gone, but I've seen pictures, family pictures of my smiling sisters and my older brother, all probably taken by my mother, although I remember my dad was there. He must have held the camera too. I remember, and it hurts to make my brain turn, happy moments with Nick in Grafton backyards where I would run down the field to Westboro Street early in the morning to wake up Rob and Nick, walking through paths we didn't realize fear yet. Revisited those paths maybe 10, 15 years ago. They scared the shit out of me then, behind my sister's apartment where that girl went missing, where the train tracks took us to Worcester and in summertime we would walk to Silver Lake Lake Ripple being too polluted to swim, but always beautiful. We would get ice cream at the same spot, a main stop next to the donut shops. My ma, she worked at the Grafton Inn, and I would fall asleep on her bedroom floor waiting for her to get home. Back then, when I could control my dreams. My mother would be home when I got home from school, and she would make chicken soup and feed me fluff and jelly, cutting each sandwich into triangles. That was the only geometry that mattered, the 360 degrees of love that my mother gave to me. My mother was den leader, along with this lady Una and this kid Kyle, or Keith was her son. I can't remember his name. I guess we weren't friends, but then I, I was just a kid. There was this one time I twisted a girl's ankle, saying, here comes Haley's comet, my first crush. I didn't realize her pain when she limped away. There was the other time when I broke a girl's porcelain dolls, not totally on purpose, but I liked her too. I guess I have always broken things. Once I broke my head open, cracked open like an egg, my blood spilling all over the sidewalk, walking away from a broken bicycle, and one day I decided not to wear my helmet. But still, when I woke up, my mom was there, my dad was there. After staring at a blue sheet, the doctor telling me to count backwards from 60 while he plunged a needle and thread into my exposed skull. My mother was there to kiss my forehead, and was there when stitches came in and when the stitches fell out. My mother was there more than my dad back then. But my dad worked hard. I respect him for that. They live in separate houses now, since I was 15. That's when you realize your parents are just people. Two people who fell in and out of love and raised you the best they could. I don't fault my mother for her flaws. I don't fault my father for his. Because they kept me fed, they kept me clean, 
They loved me. They were my king and queen. The only reason they left, they were human, flawed, and not perfect. And I am the same. Human, flawed, and not perfect. All right, so, um, you know, I'm just going to read this new one because my phone is going to fall on the ground and, and that's going to make a whole noise, so. Um, this poem is called, um, actually, it's called, I don't know how I can get this set. I don't know how I can get this set. I don't know how I can feel like this all the time and not give up. I don't know how anxiety has become such a strong barrier. I don't know how paranoia has made my snake a rattler. I just wish I could change my situation. I'm an alien in this space station. I need to read and meditate, fall back on the words that used to soothe me, like gravity, the apple and the tree. If I knew who I was and where I was going, I wasn't afraid of your face, your voice, your words, your face, your systems, your anger, your misunderstandings, your embarrassment, your widow maker, your thought hearing, your half flag raising, your unsafe streets to me and your sadness and apathy, America, then maybe I could walk free proud. But me, I'm an angry inch, a sober stain on a blood-stained shirt. I'm only as alive as the beginning of the record before they turn, the flip, and I'm not your drug culture. I don't get high and laugh. I take a bubble bath with Zyprexa. Zyprexa is ugly, not sexy like Karma, not single like Dahlia, not empty like me, not wired and witless. Zyprexa is a hideous bitch goddess, Lamictal, its dog, and me the prescribed, we the people, the Prozac, the Lamictid, the Adabania, the Geodonic Society, the Lithumial, the Schizoaffected, us the Saturday Night Crossword Solvers, we the people, we the medicinal animals tamed in mental asylum in a scrapbook album in a Polaroid, we the paranoid android, we the people, we the non-pregnable, we the avoided, turn around Delta, turn around Bright One, we the Devo with freedom of choice, the mother's blood motherless, we the khakis, we the XXL, we the sandals, we the sandwich makers, we the medicinal, we the cannabinoid paranoid, we the idea resting on the beat, resting in peace, we the chain, we the ball, we the socially distorted, we the people, I am one of many, we the half raised, we the affected, we the remembered, me the forgotten. And this is a poem that is in my new book, which is actually some poems that I wrote that are very old, that um, are from when I used to ride the train um, from when I lived in Boston. And I, I really like this poem. Um, it's kind of a sad poem, and it was, a, it was an imagination poem of a, of a woman that I saw on the train, and I was like, I wonder what her life is like. So I wrote this poem while I was on the train, thinking about this woman who was on the train, and what was her life like, and it's called Grace on the Train. And if you can just imagine, like, music playing, like, in a sub subway station, and, like, um, that's, that's where it starts, so. <clears throat> Grace on the Train. Here the musicians play softly. A lady sips tea, reading her book. We see her, though she doesn't see herself quite yet. She's never been respected or loved quite right. She lost her husband to a cancer call, and now she sits quietly, listening to the soft rhythm of the musicians. Her son's in prison, and she misses him. Sipping her tea, I see her. She seems like her name may be Grace. The only softness she maintained are the lines on her face above her brow. Too far from home, she wants to go home now. Grace, won't you stay a while and let us see your smile? The music overwhelms her, and she forgets about her world. I look up from my daydream already at downtown crossing in the middle of Boston, and I feel awesome, and I want Grace to feel the same. I'm sure Grace is not her name. She sits quietly on the train, not speaking to me or speaking at all. I imagine her wondering when she can come home and why life has to be so hard. Her husband died in 2006. Her son Jack was 18, her daughter Lucy was 12. The days were different after Dad died. They were darker, less light crept in. Jack got caught up in the violence of a bitter bet, one that couldn't be forgotten. Lost in gunshots, his friend ended up in a coffin, and Jack sits in prison still waiting for the warden. As for Lucy, she always was smart, good in school, varsity jacket on her shoulder. But sometimes life takes over, and this time it wasn't expected. The drunk driver blindsided her with his brand new Lexus. The rain starts falling hard as the traffic stops as an ambulance approaches the broken glass, as the medics surround Lucy. 
Grace can hear sirens from the train and wonders when this rain will stop. She doesn't know yet about Lucy as she listens to the music when her phone rings at Park Street. While the solemn street performer sings sadly, You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. And she drops the phone and weeps. Listening to the music, she hangs her head and prays softly, Please don't take my sunshine away. And Grace covers her head and exits the train into the falling rain, trying to find peace in all her pain. Thank you. A magazine called oddballmagazine.com. It's open to poets and um, artists. Please send your stuff to oddballmagazine.com. Check it out. Um, we update daily, and we have a great, uh, great bunch of poets who uh, are uh, on the site. So thank you. Because I, you have an understanding as being in the mental health field, the importance of writer's block, the importance of the inability to express yourself to the words, but you also captivated a peripheral vision, third eye vision, mm -hmm. to be able to see the world and society and express something that you're tapping into somebody's humanity. You have the ability to tap into somebody's soul without conversing with them because you have learned to observe and put the words that even you yourself have brought together to put it out there. You touched a couple of uh, areas in your form of expression. Memories. We cannot go back to our past. We cannot change our past. The past is last. It stays behind. But the beauty of an evolved aspiring poet and an evolved poet and a writer is that you have the ability, as you stated, to revisit, to bring that past into future words for future healings. And that's very important. And um, I love taking the train, as I shared before. And when you reference downtown crossing, before you reference downtown crossing, I was thinking of a, of a black man that was in downtown crossing playing, you know, and um, beautiful. Sometimes I take the commute because I just want to take the ride to observe, but life is in a subway. Life is in a subway uh, in our Boston system, between Cambridge, Boston, like going to some of those areas, there's a beauty of art and life and not spoken words. So I will call on you. There is one poem before we do our features and uh, when we end the open mic, you want to share? Think about every all the energies that's happening right now. Okay. I'm going to call you again. Do you, you want to do another poem? One, like, and, and, yeah. yes, okay. to close out the uh, open mic because you're here as for open mic. And this is where I stand with the high hopes. I have one more <laughs> because I feel like we are in movimiento, which means movement. And uh, so here it is. We are the movement. Voices, the voice, the force of nature. Sun up, sun down, dusk. I'm glad to introduce our next open mic, lovely Beverly. Yes. Oh, Thank you. Hi, nice to be here again. Thank you all for coming out. My first poem I will read was um, a finalist in New England Greater Brockton Society for Poetry and the Arts. They had a contest nine years ago, and uh, mine was one of the four finalists. And it's called Rising. It's about Persephone and her mother, Demeter, rising. She takes her hand as they cross, chooses the flowers they pick at the market, forbids even ear piercing. 
daughter shrinks from her slow, heavy step, while flowers weigh down the swinging hips of almost thirteen. He watches her, skinny legs long to skip over the edge of the world. In a black, shiny limo, snorting horsepower, he glides up the dirt road, sipping a pomegranate cosmopolitan in the back seat. He lowers tinted glass, offers her a sip. Won't you come in out of the glare? His gold chains outshine the sun. Shrugging out of a shiver, Persephone slides into cool, dark leather seats, sinking deeply. His ashen fingers leave their impression on her bare thigh. And I'm going to do a haiku-ish poem. <laughs> it doesn't really need all the qualifications of haiku. This is Provincetown. April on the Outer Cape, a supplement of cleansing. The rain washed light smells like mercy. And the third is for my brother who lives in California. Um, he at one time uh, thought that he might have Alzheimer's and so they were doing testing. And uh, our mother um, had Alzheimer's so it was a uh, realistic concern. So, to my brother in his forgetfulness for Brady. You walk alone into the Hansel forest. Birds are eating your memory crumbs. Your life's wrung out in dull quays. The hours leaking into a devoured mind. Last night, I dreamt us young. Third floor doors locked against dry dust smell of tenement stairs. The unpainted kitchen bent beneath its muted gray, where empty stove pans coated your tongue with a color that tastes like cheap aluminum. This morning brings crow black wings, re relentless in their noiseless flapping. Your eyes push against me like a flea to bear in mind the fairy tale and Gretel unlocking the cage door. Thank you, and these are from my book, Thread of Fire, and I brought just happened to bring them. <laughs> <laughs> So I've been 
on like a journey in um, finding ways to um, deal with some of the things that I might not have normally dealt with. So um, some of these poems are going to be a little sad, um, but it's to help me through the process. This one's called The Child Within. The child in me has had demons to get over. This adult is insecure, afraid, always looking over her shoulder. You gave me life, but oh, the hell you put me through. I couldn't fathom the depth or measure of struggles that were within you. There were many days I hurt physically, I'd break down and cry. You caused this hurt, but you gave no comfort, and I still don't know why. As a child, corrected with force, some discipline kept me in my room alone. I hated the solitude, the silence, isolation, even more now that I'm grown. This was abuse, the neglect, the shouting, your conditional love. I wasn't sure till now, but I'm a victim of. This thing that happens at home that no one talks about, revealing it will bring shame to you and your family, no doubt. I needed to be special, important, your delight, instead of disappointments of things that I didn't do right. You're pretty, but act ugly. You're smart, but act dumb. These words kept me where you wanted me, right under your thumb. I did my best, I tried so hard, but got nowhere. I got good grades, I was well behaved, but you didn't care. Rebelling was the next course, since I was a burden. Why am I not enough? Tired of trying to please you incessantly became increasingly tough. I was a star, I didn't know, but I needed to know my ability to shine. The gifts I had, you hid away from others if they were, as if they were yours, but they're mine. I entered a world that knocked me down and rejected me. It was no different from at home where no one respects me. Will I ever be something? I will get these chains off of me. I have to, but how? I've got to break free. It's a new day, a new dawn. Independence is in my grasp, so I take it with both hands. It's harder to attain, and it slips from my clasp. I can only go so far ahead that I'm lagging far behind. This is my life, not yours, through this daily grind. I'm worth so much more than you made me feel. I had no other role models, so I believed it was real. The longing to be held, accepted, and make you proud, sadly, it didn't happen. I'm just another face in the crowd. I grew into a woman, broken, so empty. There's a dimmer in my life. Having to relive the painful memories that sometimes keep me awake at night. I forgave you, now I must forgive me too. I'm no longer discouraged for not pleasing you. So I'm changing my perspective to whom I belong and reside. My heavenly Father will constantly abide. For in God's sight, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I was in a dark abyss that got my mind reeling, so unproductive the way that I have been feeling. Can I do it? No. I have done it, for God truly will know. I fought so long in silence, and the pain I refused to show. The child within is healing more than words could ever show. The obstacles will be conquered more than you'll know. For God is my Father, and I will please him with all my breath, and I won't stop this journey until the grave, my dying death. There's a breaking point we get to, and I say I've had enough. You told me I'm special and had value, while well, I'm calling your bluff. The words you gave held no power, they were corrupted and weak. Yet it entered the very core of my soul. Pain so deep, I dare not speak. I used to appease you, knowing I could never please you. Your expectations and high demands were insane. I raced around frantically, only using half my brain. I invested too much. All I wanted was a loving touch. It was my heart that led me onto your rocky shore. You led me on for far too long. I can't take it anymore. You told me you're beautiful. They say beauty's in the eye of the beholder. 
I wanted to believe you. Let's face it, time is flying and I'm getting older. I offered you the world and it was all I had. I gave all I got. Sadly, it wasn't enough. Was it all for naught? There was purpose for my intentions and love that poured out of me like a sieve. You denied that love. Now I'm not sure how to live. I thought you were special. You were such a mess. I had the patience of Job, yet I settled for less. Now I can't let you see what you mean to me, for my hands are tied and my heart's not free. I must break out of this bondage that has me bound. There's a direct line to God that brings freedom I found. I wish I could turn back the hands of time. I could erase the thoughts I had that you were ever mine. I hoped that you were the one for me, and I was blind. You gave up on us. You were callous and unkind. So it's time to start fresh with a brand new life, without the struggles, heartache, pain, and strife. Even now, I hold back the love that I could be sending. There's no way we could make it. There can be no happy ending. And this one, um, I titled it The Almost Song because I was trying to make it into a song and um, I just switched up a little bit. As morning rises, the war begins in my soul. The enemy's working double time to destroy my goal. I feel like I'm one mistake away from you leaving me today. Your endless mercy, I find rest. Nothing matters in your arms, Lord. I'm truly blessed. Will you wait for me as I find myself? I look for ways and failed attempts to gain worldly wealth. If I speak the truth, I ignore the spiritual fires within. Can I let go of the doubts once they begin? Deliver my feet from stumbling over. Things I made idle up till now I'm gonna cover. What I have in you can satisfy. Without you, God, in my life, I will surely die. How will people know what they have never heard? Get on your knees and pray and show them the word. It brings life to those who are lost, left in the cold. The salvation is for everyone, so stand up and be bold. Each day is a gift and not a given right. Do what you can to be your best. Never quit, always fight. Leave no stone unturned, leave fears behind you. Praise God in all things, for his words are alive and true. I can't rewind one moment once it's passed me by. You can't be stuck in regrets and questions of why. Jesus, come rinse in my heart. Give peace to my soul. Let me make a brand new start. Forgive your enemies. Pray daily to God above. The answer is simple, my friends. You have to be loved. Thank you. Sometimes it takes a spirituality, a type of faith, so that you can be inspired and believe that your words are resonating and being heard and felt for, by someone else. That's what spirituality is all about. And I want to continue forward. Again, thank everyone who has come up. We're going to continue to move forward with Beverly. You can come up. And um, it's your turn again. And I definitely want to hear some more of your poetry. Welcome. Now, don't you feel quite lucky? 
fill up this bag. So fill up the stars. Welcome. Can we show our appreciation for Alec and the great job? So this summer I went to uh, Greece to visit my father's hometown. You know, my father's hometown is 4,825 miles from Morocco. Wow. <laughs> to get to my father's hometown, you have to take a ferry, which takes five hours to get there. Huh. Rented a car and went to the outskirts of his village. And when I say village, I mean village. <laughs> uh, you're taken back almost to the 17th century. Park the car on the outside of the village because you can't bring the car into the village. You have to walk. And as I was walking to his village and I went to the birthplace of his of his home, I was again in the 17th century, just about. When I went back to my room, I flipped on my computer and I was in the 21st century, which was quite a shock. Um, but Inspiration followed, and um, I wrote this poem. Ancient Ruins, a montage of 15 meditations. A day is but a moment among ruins. Ever-changing years seem to weave a seamless continuum of unbroken time over ancient broken sites. Yet, why does the earth spin on its axis along the same sunny path? Why does the globe carry all our pieces in a closed loop? Sky blue and sky white mirror the sea and draw us into reflection and seduce us to delve into deep, separate oceans to seek origin. But when do we truly look at each other as specimens of the species human. Are we evolving or are we devolving? Scholars remind us to learn from our past or be condemned to repeat it, but what have we learned of science, mathematics, religion, philosophy, and greed? Who gave us opposable thumbs to crush the future, who gave us tools to create. Oh my God, what have we created? We call ourselves compassionate, human, humane, and intelligent as nations bleed between fingers too tiny to hold the future. Why do so many hands squeeze out innocence in the name of what deity? Why do we seek sanctuary in time of suffering, seek safe passage, refuge, and haven, but harbor leaders who turn eyes blind or away? Does Mother Earth fear her garden grow barren as her marrow is sucked out? While crimes against humanity regenerates like an infectious cancer. We cry out animal at those who do us injustice. We cry out around mouthfuls of burnt fat and guzzled spirits. And just where are we on the evolutionary scale? We wonder at ancient ruins and marvel at what was. What do such acts foretell? Will there be anything to wonder about us, I wonder, today, among the ruins. <clears throat> so this is my wife's 10th anniversary when she passed. And I recently did a work, I facilitated a workshop for grief support. And one of the things that I do in the support group is share some of my poetry. And I read this poem, and one of the people in the workshop got up and 
they asked me, well, how could you read that poem? And I stood for a minute and thought about it and just said, imagine if it was still inside me. If I didn't get it out. So this is the poem I shared uh, with the grief support. It's called Walking Into Walls. In the middle of the night, I felt you leave. The pillow hollow. Sound of the clock echo time. It was just me crying. It was just you closing the door. The morning wept on the outside world. No rainbows. Sound of nothing etched through my body. It was just me walking into walls, trying to find my way, stumbling graceless into the unknown, demanding to make sense. I felt the mirrored ache, reflective sorrow, cold reality splashes my face, numb actuality awakens tears. It was just me, one day, then another, one foot, in front of the other. I watched the wind take you away out of the currents of my heart, and now this empty ache, the valentine heart replaced, and now this empty ache. My thoughts reaching to the times we held tight, fingers dig, fighting for every inch, not wanting to let go. What I didn't realize, these, were the last passionate kisses. I didn't count the years, only moments life granted me, but that I took for granted. Tears, laughter, stillness, parted. Puff of breath erased the flame, candle wax went so soft and supple, hardens. It was just me, daydreaming of you, it was just me awake under sunlight in an enclosed room. And I am walking into walls trying to find my way, stumbling into the unknown. Graceless. so that your poetry and your words continue to live on like a tree because paper comes from trees so they can have the duration of life as a tree because a tree passes certain people in humanity and so those books even after you pass through there and that's why we love Brockton Public Library yes I had to go there great did that sound like a poem? Share us the title of your book, and then we'll go from there. And I'm also going to call you, Jason, one more reading from your book, and share the title of your book. Because the reality is, we have Mark Lincoln here. We have Brockton Access Local TV. And that means that there are hundreds of individuals who's going to be reading. And somebody might want to contact the library and say, wait, I'm inspired of that book. Well, and then after, we're going into our features. I am so excited, and they're ready, and I'm ready for them too. <laughs> So, um, Red of Fire, Poems of Peril, Longing, and Walls. Okay, and uh, this is for my dear friend Dolores Riccio, who passed away a couple of years ago, very suddenly. So, for Dolores as the crow flies. 
As the crow flies, she slips through the ribs, roosts in the heart. Her feathered shoulders wrap the morning close. Slow spread of wings, tears a hole in the muscle. Her brass tunnels upward, black bill opens, harsh, raucous call, speaks midnight. She lets loose a broken tiger that sounds almost human in an alto voice that mimics mine or is. Thank you. Back and forth, her hair had long grown long. 
Blood was in her eye sockets, but oh God, her eyes were gone. And there I was in my old neighborhood on that the coldest night with the undead creeping closer, me being the only thing alive. I backed away, I tried to, but I must have slipped over the bones of something near that creek. And there I splashed into the pond, the one I loved to swim. And it was cold, really cold, as they were closing in. So I tried to swim out to the farthest bank, 40 feet away. Figured I could run into the woods and then I might be saved. But as I tried to swim into the deep, my leg started to cramp and I tried again. But my arm gave up and there I was in the middle of the pond, the one where I would go when I was young. Now the water was too high, I began to fill my lungs. I gasped for air as I began to sink into the briny deep. And there I sank till I fell asleep in eternal, eternal dream. But then the alarm clock rang and I awoke in pain to an undead zombie gnawing at my brain. Wow. So, uh, that, that poem was called uh, To an Undead Zombie. Um, thank you. <laughs> Start with um, with Carly, respectfully, because she's our youth, and Carly is an inspiration, an inspiration to the youth, especially to the city of Brockton. Carly is a 16-year-old. Her full name is Carly De Miranda Paris. She's a 16-year-old Brockton High School student that uses poetry to show the hardships of her youthful life and what she has learned throughout the years. She presents herself her poetry so that the listeners may understand her ways of life and how she copes with her times and days. Throughout her journey as a junior, yes, I put it another year, right? She also expresses her day's work at school or the social aspect of high school, which is struggles for many, especially the youth and the teens, in a way that usually is perceived by her peers and fellow students. So Kari, welcome <coughs> once again. <laughs> distress and frustration that no one understands, but you don't let anybody in. 
Other people in this world feel lonely as well. So how can you say that you feel lonely when those strangers are in the same boat as you? It's up to you to figure out how you can break through those walls so you can stop feeling so alone.
I'm hoping in the future that there could be a club or even a meeting that there will be more mental awareness within the school because a lot of students already uh, don't really talk to a lot of people. They only have about four adjustment counselors at BHS. Uh, I'm grateful for that, but there needs to be more focus on mental health. So this last poem is called uh, Questions to Find Me. This poem takes inspiration from a college essay sample that I read in my English class. I found it interesting um, that it reminded me of a game that I used to play. It's called Akinator. And uh, you basically would think of somebody and it would try and think of the person that they're asking you the questions of. So like say for example, you're trying to think of like Michael Jackson, it would just be like, oh, did he sing Thriller? You'd be like, yes. And then it would be like, are you thinking of Michael Jackson? So, here I go. I get onto my laptop and got and get onto the genie asking Meister game to see if anything interesting would happen. Ah, I know. I'll try and make the genie think of myself. So, I run through the basics, hair color, skin color, height, yada yada yada. My face loses tension and gains a frown. One of the questions I'm asked is, is the person depressed? Now, I don't know who has spied on me well enough to recognize that I am of such nature, but they hit the hammer on the head of the nail on that one. I say yes. The genie asks me another question. Is this person a people pleaser? Silence fills up my room. I contemplate about this term for a few minutes, and I say yes. I'm somewhat in despair due to how accurate this genie is. Question after question, it gets to the point where it's personal, almost turning into an alter ego of myself where it judges me. They ask me, does this person have a disgusting looking face? Are they extremely close to being classified as a midget? Do their fingers look like baby carrots? My mind is racing with thoughts, but I say yes to all those questions. I stand up and walk away from my desk as I look back to see the genie almost kind of looking like me. I ask myself, was I judging myself the whole time? Was it me asking myself those questions? I see my name pop up as a person who the genie thinks I was describing, and I'm in utter shock as to what I think of myself. Carly, thank you once again. We look forward to seeing you ongoing next year and even after you graduate, because I still know you have another full year. And as Paul on director stated, this is what what's one of the things that he's definitely inspired and loves to facilitate, and we in the community love to encourage, love to build, love to support our youth, and you are a voice of many. Brockton Public Schools, especially the high school, is overpopulated, and many of the students are not able to express themselves. And I hope that you continue on to advocate and most be able to share words right there at that high school and whatever we can do to support and advocate on your behalf to open those venues, that's what we're here for. Thank you. We're gonna move forward. And uh, before we close out with our last final feature, we're gonna respectfully call Beverly one more time because she was also an author and wanted to share one more excerpt of her poetry and her poems of her book. Welcome, Beverly. <laughs> Thank you. 
If you strike out, it's okay. Be good again tomorrow. It's your annual day.
advice to a young princess being pursued. Advice to a young princess being pursued. Here's a secret. He won't want you if you outrun him. Princes wish for swooning spells, fits of delirium, thin pretty girls in bone corsets made to bind. Better yet, he would be repelled by large feet made for trampling dirt roads. A prince desires the heart of a bloody foot bound in glass, the mermaid who pines for legs to open, and not the freedom of an entire ocean. You won't see him as you're coming, but you'll feel his hunger in the form of a thousand pinpricks on the back of your small white neck, where your hair's been pinned up so beautifully for the ball, his wedding night, for the red mouth of the volcano waiting for sacrifice. But that won't matter to you anymore. What will matter is the breadth and scope of the horizon calling for you. Your lungs will fill with clean, cold air, ropey, tight muscles you'll discover as you run to outrace time. Your row of princess and the broken hymen, your father and mother waiting back home with the dowry on all of their good intentions. Right now, though, there is only this straight line, a thread of hope, the sun and moon so far away from you now. Ready? Go. This, uh, this next piece is entitled Ophelia in Stasis, um, my, my liberal interpretation of the Shakespearean story. Ophelia in Stasis. I won't imagine how long she's been there, in Silver River or bathtub, with her head bent back against the hard white marble, or fingertips slipping along the edge of flood. I'll try to imagine her body's movements now, swept along with the currents and eddies, her hair seaweed waving for sailors, her own sailor never to come again. She must move now, as she did in life, flowing with whatever wind and words whispered in her ear, with scarcely an afterthought, propelled always by another's momentum by the sword and thrust of another's words. She could be ageless, but most likely she's a girl. Her limbs are slender and white. I would see the pronouns clavigo, her throat opening tonight. Over and over, her drowned form, the silence of transgression, has been linked to water lilies, crowned by flowers and reeds, surrounded by small golden fish captured in words and frozen by the master's eye. But I dream her core sometimes as a red fist, ready to awake, shaking off the clinging flowers, ready to eat the world. August grid smells of old hot dog water, 
Pigeons bathing in fountains, children running into fountains, shimmering up fire escapes, and this whole damn apple wavy with summer, stank and construction yells, and how mommy stops me from buying arancini as I quell saliva and lust. Boys grow tall and harder in their Jordache jeans, breakdancing near the jungle gym, and Gina can't have enough Aquanet to keep her bangs so high, closer to empire, her state, the apple of her ass, taunting the entire playground. Even the cigarette smoke snakes a corner, all over, all over. There are diamonds on Canal Street, there are needles in the sky, and hawkers hiding from police, and their warning cries down the street grids are ocean sonic and important. So blankets of fuchsia, sienna, rapa, as hands hide tchotchkes, fruit flies all running away from the scrabble, this gaudy, dragon ghetto of the Northeast. Chinatown, Chinatown, how we all try to outrun you. Chinatown, Chinatown, your alleys in my veins. Perfect. I am never late. My cuticles push in perfectly pinked crescent moons of smile and ball of my back, acquiesce to all elders. I've memorized the color wheel, not a drip of blood on white jeans. How is it that I have time each giggle? high and warbling, tuned to crystal. My orgasms always coincide with the other. I then make toast, shimmy up the stairs in black silk, scent redolent of mangoes and feathers. I never snore. Today, though, the sea calls herself by her own name. My voice contains gravel, opium, saxophone, the blood pulse at first, unfamiliar, forges on and on. To walk solitary on city streets. To smile for no one. What is this? This next piece is untitled, but if anyone has any ideas, I'd love to hear them. It's for the Statue of Liberty very timely poem, although I did not write it recently. Untitled. She stands, back to the billowing wind, the green isolated wreckage of a gift long rusted, pained by consumption and a thousand centuries of rain. No great wind lifts her dress so that, may, so that we may see the woman, the girl underneath the green, the flesh of the promise, the tired come, the hungry, in masses gray and forever. The land is divided into lines, state, brother, color, north and south, and sister and bloodlines, and the lines will continue to threaten until the cup will crack one day, until something more than blood will flow from the earth below. She stands on land that is half island, half haven. They will come because of streets which are gold, because of the burning fields of sugar cane and the burning buildings of genocide, fratricide. They will come because of hunger and a thirst something more ambiguous, something not, never to be found underneath a rusting steel skirt. Fairies circle like birds or prayers around her. When they come, they will renounce their homelands, their names, and the places of wandering so long ago. The old streets melt away already, soon. Now, they turn to face destinies as fragile as islands. They are the uncertain mooring rocks a lullaby. They are as unknowing as babies. The great green lady never smiles. Her glacial beauty is a mocking promise. And yet, we wait for the wind to blow her dress. We wait for her to reveal her secrets. This is the lunar um, year of the pig. It, this is not a pig poem. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a lunar New Year poem based on, on memory. Untitled, 
I dreamt of blood red canary pages etched in saffron. One horizon, one dash. The pigeons outside I'll grind. I'll crack to glass overlooking Triborough Bridge. I'll try Warbolt. I was always afraid of firecrackers each new year. I couldn't tell them apart from red envelopes, red badges, red shame on my face at the food stands and lunch tickets. My sister and I never had red jello until public school, quivering and intact in artifice. We swallowed while fire crackled new animals, ram, pig, tiger, dragons breathing in our small cavities, sharp tongues lashing on our faces, blood welts. I think I have about four more pieces. Um, thank you all. Sonnet. I want to meet you in uncertain light. I want to meet you surely, hours like silk unraveling before our eyes. Bright is our tomb of sorrow. Days of milk have fallen from fingers. Dust replaces song. You drink and try to break me by uncertain dark. I think and learn to live with knowledge, bloodless. Apart, the pearl is everything without the oyster. Together, yet, they break the shocking sea, its daunting face inglorious. The blue of eons waits for each of us. The stars explode in gray, unclean places. And you and I will look beyond these burning spheres. So large and soon is this lifetime, your hand here. This is an academic advising poem. I never thought I would write one, but <laughs> my student cries to me. My office, overhead lighting shines me complicit, greedy. She tells me the professor is racist. She can't pay any more tuition. She designs small hospital rooms, white gowns, alabaster nurses, is told she can't spell, is, call, is called girl twice. I nod, tell her I understand. I grow fat on administration, student objectives, learning out. Comes, she beseeches me, wants the words. I agree, this is bias. I turn my screen, consult the guidelines from academic policy, refer her to two other administrators. My eyes dart down. I know you are right. My yellow skin embeds memories, and my cheeks burn, fuses to your own now, so hot. I email her the correct PDF. Only. This is only one street, one street lamp. It is only your face illuminated by brownstones and moonlight. The clean shell of you. It is only the rain, this night, this rain like poison, softly singing. I am telling you that your fleeing sears me. I am telling you that the world flees and sears. I am telling you that sometimes the access does not comply. Two hands do not meet. But nonetheless, we turn. We keep turning. Tonight, the globe quakes and threatens to split. We are afraid. We do not know who or what will come from this darkness like tar. Tonight, we are all refugees. What sort of country would accept us like this, naked, without reckoning, and without alms? Tonight, roses and geraniums bloom and die quietly. They are their own life. They have nothing to do with us. What sort of world would wait for us while this happens? One street, one street lamp, one man. 
this earth like a crazed widow calling us back. Here, we are beyond knowing. We are defined by amber and we blaze. Two more pieces um, of a short piece called Awake. Um, I suspect many of you in this room deal with insomnia. <laughs> and then a longer piece called Empty. So I'll read Awake first. Awake. I don't want to be up like this. Like the leaves outside this window. Their flat palms eclipse the surface of the moon and I am not blind. But nonetheless, it is one o'clock. The night turns vertigo. I turn in towards myself, sink into years of blood and bones, juices and hot salt. I go deeper than tissue. I fall into the last division, essential, starlight. I bite into my blanket and pillow. Elsewhere, people are sinking their teeth into steaks with the fat reflecting the sun's light. I'm hungry. I drink hot liquids, but I am so hungry. I stay awake, count the dead, measure my own odds, wait for morning. Tell me, what is normality? What keeps you up at night? And this last piece is called Empty. It's written in four parts. Empty, one. Snow White lived long enough to see her bloom destroy a family. Mother, let me reassure you that I've held my bloom in check. My body holds a power in the shift of my hips and the slide of my bones, the purse of my lips. I move and then respond. Does this frighten you? Will we live out another Snow White story again? Soon, I will shrink. There will be no competition, no fear and I'll need less than snowfall to survive. I won't come for anyone, the vacuum between my legs, familiar like the coldness of dimes. My hip bones are their own mountains. Every night, I scale them with my fingers, and I always win. I always reach the top. A woman is a vessel. I'll keep my own container empty. It is not a return I want, not to the womb, to the laps of fathers. It is a need for cool blue stars, a body written in angular lines, the truth of a field without wheat or snowfall. No man will fight through the wall of roses for me. A spinster girl dried out before her time. Two, to float beyond bellies and thighs means to go beyond that body in the bath, languid, dumb to cold and hunger, one by one, we'll scrape out sustenance from the bottoms of bowls, from servings no larger than fists. Our hearts go on yearning as pure muscle, float as angels and vultures, searching for the dead, decaying matter, good enough for us. This is the field we run on. Three, remember, a city street in December and we're holding each other in the snowfall. I am five, this is a game. Flakes of snow fall onto our tongues, chocolate, vanilla, mango, candy. Around us, the city burns with the cleanness of bones. We are composed of marrow, sinew, radiance. Your arms lock around me. The world locks into a context I can finally understand. I'll never feel this nourished again. Remember this, I have never rejected your body with its milk and musk. Always there was upheaval between us, skin, the thin edges of cliffs worn already. Overhead, skywards, the baby birds call out to the sun. All this need expanding the sky. Four, dear to live, wait for me in springtime when Kayla Lilies and Jasmine blows across our skin. In the silence of bell towers, the echoes come, holy, holy, holy. Forget the rules of marrow and hunger, incessant ice upon your tongue. The oranges are crying out for you. 
Here is sugar, here is salt. Here is your belly swollen with almonds, chocolate, the fattened beast, the unborn laughter. Thank you. Dubbins. I dropped this poem that used to be a song for the POWs. <laughs> 